Hello, and welcome to Film Slam Streaming's post-film conversation for Unapologetic. My name is Eric Seiler, and I'm an instructor of film, media arts, and communications, as well as moderator for this conversation. We are very pleased to be joined by the director of Unapologetic, Anthony Ciancio. Anthony's joining us from Chicago today. Hello, Anthony, and welcome. Hey, Eric. Good to see you. Good to see you as well, too, and thank you for bringing us this important film, an important piece of work, artistry, and so forth. Uh, so let's get right into it. Um, Roger Carter, um, can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with them? Um, how did you get to know him and his artwork? Um, Roger, I actually found and met by accident. Um, COVID was, uh, we, were, we were just in the thick of it that first summer. So there was a lot of uncertainty, even in our film program with DePaul, people were sort of in limbo. And, um, you know, a lot of people weren't able to make things. Um, I really wanted to do something on a street artist, actually. So I was on the hunt for a street artist in Chicago. We have a ton of street art everywhere. There's some really great stuff. And um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the artists here, like, have some political messaging or have messages that are trying to get across, either inspiring or, you know, making people think. And so I wanted to try and find someone like that. And I actually, um, I met a couple um, different artists and then I met a guy who manages street artists in Chicago, who helps them sell their work and show their work and get them more work. And um, it's called Artist Replete. They got a, a nice operation. And when I met with this guy, he was telling me about some street artists, but then he also said, he goes, I just met this guy, Roger, and I've never seen anything like his work and he's just brilliant. And he mentioned him, he's like, he's not technically a street artist, but he's some, someone doing something really interesting. And, um, and that summer was just very, you know, kind of, a chaotic, crazy, stressful summer, I think, you know, with, with um, George Floyd and that had happened. And then I met Roger and then I see his work and it was just this culmination of everything. And so I'm like, yeah, I want to meet him. And I met him and we hit it off and it just sort of went from there. So you mentioned you were looking for a street artist. Why a street artist in particular were you looking for? You know, I like, I'm sort of a, I, I'm a self-taught photographer and um, I love uh, street photography. And a lot of times, uh, you know, I just like the, the images of, you know, a big mural or something in a city or when you see little pops of street art where you wouldn't expect it. Um, I, I, I just love that sort of thing. So I often am like... Uh, when I get any free time, I'm just sort of urban exploring by myself, just sort of wandering through the city or finding different neighborhoods or a lot of murals are hidden in, in, in weird places where you wouldn't expect. And so I just like that that vibe. And I love the people who go out and do this stuff. I mean, they do it at all sorts of hours. There's guys who hang off of like buildings and do things that I wouldn't necessarily recommend, but um, they do them because sometimes that's the only time they can do it. And uh I just think that life is interesting and I like that these a lot of these artists are expressing something through their art and not coming out and saying it you know they're not necessarily writing any words up there but a lot of times their their stuff makes you think and I, I always think that's just so cool because film does the same thing and but they're doing it in a different way. I see but I guess with the there are a lot of street artists out there and uh, Roger's you know, uh, messages through his art are as uh, are very um, uh, what I'm trying to say um, invigorating in a sense. So, was there something particular about his message that um, drew you into featuring him as opposed to someone else? Yes, definitely. I mean, I think I think Roger is so inspiring, and I think talking to him and also seeing his artwork you realize he you know he's he's not one of those guys who you meet him and he just talks politics and he he's just a regular dude he loved to play basketball you know he talked about his father a lot and talked about growing up in Chicago but um he does have this rebellious streak in him he's very much 
his own guy. Like I, I've seen Roger in other rooms and Roger is Roger and Roger is not really trying to be anybody else. Um, and, you know, I think he, he is brave in a way where I think he's, he's not afraid to, you know, talk about, you know, the, you know, the effect of law enforcement on Chicago or the segregation that happens in the city. But he, he has a way of expressing it through his art that I just think is so cool. And then, and then he'll do a piece like, um, you know, his Muhammad Ali piece, which I didn't make it into the film, but that was the first piece I saw. And it was like a six foot tall thing. And it was just amazing. And, you know, I just love the way that he takes these important figures, um, you know, mostly black figures or people of color and represents them in a whole new way. And um, oftentimes, yes, they are these rebellious figures who found a way to protest through their art. And he's protesting through his art by representing them. So all that is just was always so interesting to me about him. So uh, you, you met Roger. Um, tell us about the production process. Uh, how much time did you spend with him before you started filming? How long did it take to film? Just take us through that whole production journey. Sure. Um, so I met him at his house in Bronzeville, Chicago, which is, I'm in Chicago now. It's a few neighborhoods over, um, not far from me, but um, a little bit south in Chicago. And so I went there. And uh, the first time I met him, uh, he's a bit shy at first. And, um, but then he showed me a lot of his work and, you know, I, I, I'm from Chicago, born and raised. So, um, you know, it's just something about, you know, meeting someone else who's actually born and lived in Chicago. You have some connection just growing up and being in the city. Um, even though Roger's experience is much different than mine, it's still, you know, interesting to find those connections. But, um, I had, uh, he showed me through his place. He showed me even how he, how he made some of the pieces, which was cool. And then um, when I left for the first time, I immediately called my, um, my friend and collaborator, Courtney. And um, Courtney is a black female director in my DePaul program. And she's a dear friend of mine, super talented. And uh, I was just like, listen, Courtney, I'm, I'm, in case you can't tell, I'm a white dude. And I just felt like, hey, like I cannot responsibly do this project unless I have someone who can help me like with my blind spots or, you know, totally, you know, tell this story how it needs to be told. And so I, I basically presented Courtney with this project. I said, I want to do a film on Roger, but I, I really need your help. Like I have no one else she was just like first on my list and she uh we talked it out and she agreed and so then she came and met roger and then she, as soon as she saw it, she's an artist herself she was blown away and then we set up an interview um so we really only probably chatted with him a couple times because it was like we did kind of want to move quickly and with covid too it wasn't like you, you did it was the summer of 2020 so it was hard to hang out you know even when we're in this house we're masked up it's it was a little bit you know not not your typical thing and you just unfortunately didn't feel like you could hang out as much um you know it was just really dicey that that, that summer so um but we did set up an interview at a super small crew it was Courtney and I um, who worked on the questions and what we're going to ask Roger. We talked about that a lot, you know, how to ask things maybe in not your typical way, also how to like start light because Roger is a bit shy and we didn't want to just come out, you know, just blazing, like asking him deep questions right away. And Courtney brought a lot of insight into, you know, things she was curious about she loves sports and Roger has a basketball background. And so we wanted to touch on that. Roger like, was supposedly really great in high school and it, you know, he really uh, could have played, but then, you know, he, he, even in the interview, he said he just got turned off from basketball, but he always wishes he kind of stuck with it. Um, so, and then we brought in another guy, Greg, who was our uh, student at, at DePaul. And he came in and did sound and camera. So it was just the three of us. So we set up a day, 
set up in Roger's living room. So we have video of the whole interview, which was about 75 minutes, but we didn't use that in the film. Um, but we have the footage because we needed the audio for sure. But I like, I like, uh, I've done this before. I like having the footage just in case, um, in case you want to use it. But I think oftentimes you, you really don't need it. Um, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's sometimes cooler to hear his voice and then see him doing something else. So um, that's why, uh, that's why I didn't make it in the film. But um, yeah, the interview really went well. We had a really good report. Courtney and I both asked questions. Um, I, we took a lot of notes during the interview, you know, you're scratching things out. Okay. He touched on this. Okay. Wow. He, he said a couple things that surprised us and took us in a couple different directions. His, his, um, his occupation as a, uh, software engineer totally blew us away because it was like during the interview that it really hit me that like the way his mind worked for software engineering, like these little how he puts these little pieces together to make a bigger whole is exactly what he does with his work. And it's so interesting to see that like his mind translates that way. Um, so yeah, once the interview was done, then Courtney and I took the audio, we transcribed it. There's, um, um, there's software online that you can do that. So we uploaded it, then we had all the words. I went through, kind of edited it. And, you know, you're kind of just looking for what are the things he's saying, you know, over and over again, and, you know, protesting through his art um, and certain things that, that he was saying, you know, we sort of then really, you got to whittle all that down the 75 minutes worth of interview. And really we're taking like, you know, a minute or so of sound bites into a five and a half minute film. So it's, it's, that's the hardest part. He said so much cool, so many cool things. And there's so much backstory on Roger and his and his growing up life and his dad. I mean, he got emotional and choked up at one point. And so, but you know, it's it's hard to put that in when you're trying to focus on, you know, one tell one story in a short film. You have to really, you know, be focused on how you tell it. And so we wanted to show Roger's personality and then show, you know, how he protests through his art and what his why he does what he does. And so that's what kind of led us to the sound bites we use and then pass it along to an editor. I tried to edit the first few cuts. I'm not a good, you know, I, I can edit, but I'm not as good as an actual editor. So uh, uh, Magdalena, our editor took what I did and then totally added all those creative touches, like the, um, the transitions of the toy soldiers over his face and, she gave it an artistry and a creativity that I was not able to do. And um, sound design came in. Um, she found the music too that we use, which is always a tricky thing as a film student. You know, you can't, you don't have the money to, you know, you want to use all these cool songs that you know, and Roger's big into music, but we just couldn't do that. So I was like, all right, we, we had to find something that worked that was still in line with Roger's character that had some energy. And, um, you know, that helped a lot, but then, uh, so it did take a while with COVID. I had a couple other projects too. So it was about, it was about a solid year editing, sound design, all that stuff before we had the finished project and color came in last. And that actually just got done like this year because the way we filmed it was with a few different cameras. Cause it was COVID. I had my camera. I kind of stitched it together with whatever, shot it with whatever I had at the moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's always, uh, takes a, a small village and collaboration is key. You can find people that, to help you. Yeah, well, I, I applaud you for, you know, putting this together. And most importantly, you knew what you didn't know, bringing in Courtney into uh, this piece was vital. Uh, and uh, that's one thing if we have any as uh, um, aspiring filmmakers out there, you know, you don't have to know everything. You know, you just, you know, bring in a team to help, you know, make the piece, um, you know, work. So that's, that's really great. Uh, you know, I know there's um, this, uh, the, this rebellious nature, as you indicated in the film, but tell us a little bit about the reception of the film. How did people receive it or did everyone receive it the same? You know, I'll, I'll say it, honestly, and I didn't mention this, um, I come from a law enforcement family. 
My dad is a Chicago police officer, retired. My brother is Chicago police. My uncle was a commander in Cicero. Um, I have friends in Chicago police. So you can imagine it's a bit touchy. Um, and um, my wife and I talked about this a lot. Even, you know, I was... I was nervous. I was super scared because I, I, I uh, you know, when things get hot and, and, and things happen in the world, you know, especially these things you see on the news with police and it's upsetting. It upsets me at such a deep level. And it's so conflicting because I have family who have served and I know, I know good police officers, you know, I know, you know, uh, but I know that it's also very, you know, it is, uh, it's not a perfect system. And like, I, I, I am always, I respect the people that I know in the cert because I will add, I'll call my brother. Like when things happen, I'll, I'll be like, can you explain this to me? You know? And so he will talk it out with me and he'll, he's a pretty good sounding board. Cause he'll be like, listen, this is why this happened. Or he's like, this was wrong. You know? So with George Floyd, it was like so obvious, you know? Um, but my point in saying all this is, when we did get released, you know, I, I told people what I was working on, but like, you know, not everyone knew the scope of it. And, um, but before, right before we were released that I was nervous about what, what those folks would say. And, um, you know what, a lot of them really loved it. I, I was, I was, and they were genuine. Like I, I, they were like, you know, Oh my God, I love this work. It's so cool what he's doing. And I was just blown away. I was like, God, you know, what was I stressing about? But um, I think that go, that's a, that, I don't think that's anything to do with me more, more so. I think that's a testament to Roger and how he approaches things. I really think Roger approaches things with love, even the way he talks. It's like, I'm not telling you to be a Republican or a Democrat or anything like that. Like, that's why I left that in there because he really is like that. I think he can have a conversation with anybody. Um, and and I'm sure even some of his thoughts are pretty provocative. I don't think you can, I don't think you can pigeonhole him one way or the other. I think he'd probably shock you like on how he thinks about things. And I think that's a lot of people is we're not one, you know, sometimes it's easy to put people on one side or another, but I think people are more complex than that. And I think Roger expresses that. And um, so those, a, lot of, a lot of that nervousness was, went by the wayside and then so many other people loved it of course like I, I just I think people were um and just it was just Roger's work and I, I think it was more because we we revealed his work later which I really wanted to try to do which was show Roger working but not really getting a sense of what his work looked like until you know the final moments of the film and so I I, I think uh, when I've sat in rooms with people who watch it you kind of hear a little bit of a wow, like or a sort of a gasp when they see, you know, especially um, you know um, the later pieces that are just huge. Um, so I just think uh, that that's cool to see, and people enjoy it. You know, well, great, great. Uh, I'm glad you shared that information with us about your family. That's really, really uh, cool. Uh, as we wrapping up here, um, unapologetic. Why did you um, uh, call the film that? <laughs> we we had a few titles. I can't remember a lot of them now, but um, um, you know Roger, and again this goes back to like Ro Roger being Roger. Roger is unapologetically Roger. Roger's gonna say, you know, what's on his mind. He's very um, he's very sure of himself. He knows who he is, and he uh yeah he is just very unapologetic about the way he lives his life and on a daily basis and what he does and what he says and in his artwork and i think um yeah to me it was just uh it was the only title really in my mind um after we really thought about it great so what's next for you um are you thinking about making this into a feature are you um moving to another area in terms of filmmaking um, so I'm actually working on a couple other short documentaries now. One is about um, a cover band in the suburbs called The Pigs, um, which is kind of a funny name, but they're actually really good. And my, my, my wife's sister, my sister-in-law is their only 
um, female member and she's a singer and they recruited her from like a karaoke night and they have like a huge following. So it's kind of a crazy story. Um, And these people are all in their mid forties, close to 50 and they play shows and they have people who follow them. I think it's the message there is just, you know, creativity doesn't have to end or you just found find these creative outlets outlets and they they all have regular jobs they're lawyers and financial people and whatever but they come together and do that and i have another uh, short documentary on a bocce league that has kind of exploded in the city or just outside the city um that has all these people playing of all ages and backgrounds and bocce ball has just become kind of a just uh, blown up like uh, nationwide um, and then I'm also working on a short, um, a narrative short, fictional short that we're going to shoot this summer, something with a little science fiction. Um, so I've kind of scratched the documentary itch and I want to do, do something a little more uh, narrative. So we'll see. Great, great. It's uh, important to diversify yourself as a filmmaker. And um, yeah. I'll close with the, um, the words of uh, Roger Carter. He says that's important that we document our, our times here on this earth. And I'm really glad that you documented him as an artist, filmmaking artist, um, and bringing us this important piece of work. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, Roger. Roger always says it's best. Says it uh, says it best. So uh, I appreciate that. That's uh, good message. That's all the best to you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Mm-hmm. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this important and invigorating conversation. For more information about upcoming film festivals, please visit us at clevelandfilm.org. I'm Eric Seiler. Thank you.